ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm John Weeks and this is The Leader. After experiencing the driest July since 1935, the first hosepipe ban of 2022 is in place in the UK. People in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight are the first to face a ban and they'll be followed by people in the South East in a week's time. But it's not looking good for people in London either. The source of the Thames has dried up for the first time on record, according to river experts. The head of the river is now more than five miles downstream, and forecasters are warning of yet another heatwave next week. Plus, some experts have taken aim at water companies themselves for the way they've controlled our water supplies. So how have we come to this situation? And could we see more bands across the country now and in the future? Dr. Robert Thompson, meteorologist at the University of Reading, joins me now. So Rob, we have this hosepipe ban in place in Hampshire and on the Isle of Wight. There's another one coming in in the southeast. How did we get here? How did we get to the hosepipe ban? It's quite tricky in a sense it has been very dry really over the last year and the last month in particular so i'm in reading i work for the university of reading we have an observatory that has taken measurements in reading for 115 years of rainfall and we just had the driest ever july that we'd ever recorded in that so it has been very dry but it is noticeable that while it was the driest july on the record It was nowhere near as dry as our driest June or our driest May, even our driest April. So it's unusual, but it's not miles out of the ordinary. We are not talking that 40 degrees we had two weeks ago. It's not that level of unusual. But continually, it's been quite dry over every season for the last year, really. So We've had a run of it being a bit dry and then suddenly very dry. It's also been really hot recently, not just warm, hot. So that will mean there's been a lot more water usage, particularly in gardens and so on. Just the sheer heat will have caused huge amounts of evaporation. People watering at bad times of day in terms of water loss won't have helped. But actually, I think most people know that when it was that hot, there was no point watering at lunchtime. It was just too hot. So I think that is really what's gone on. It's been very dry, but also the heat has just led to more use of water. And there's been some criticism of how the water companies have dealt with our water supply. Have they done anything wrong? I've certainly seen a lot of criticisms of water companies on leakages and so on. As long as I can remember, I've heard these complaints all the time. And I guess it's an ongoing problem fixing leaks. I think it's difficult. Perhaps we should have seen earlier on in the summer more on how to save water and how to do more effective watering of gardens, because I suspect almost everybody has been out watering gardens more than we've normally done. And that has got to be a huge factor on where we've got to in terms of the water situation, the just deficit in reservoirs, etc. And so perhaps water companies should be going out more with sort of public information really rather than commands and demands and so on just saying that this is good ways to save an amount of water that's worth saving i can think of examples so around our house we have four fish tanks we have to change quite a lot of water on them fairly regularly for the welfare of the animals that live in them but all of the water we take out we use to water the garden and the house plants we throw almost no water away from those things because it's actually really good for the plants so actually the th- plants thrive off it and the fish thrive from the changes so in a sense it doesn't cost us extra water to do so we're saving water and there's lots of things there's the classic one that you hear of a w- saves water turning the tap off while you're brushing your teeth between rinsing your toothbrush it doesn't save very much but you're probably brushing your teeth twice a day, everybody, it's going to add up fairly quickly to a reasonable amount of saving. So are you expecting to see more bans across the country, considering just how dry July was with another heatwave due next week? I guess the answer is it's going to really depend on what the weather is going to do. The forecast really for the next week or so, no rain in the southeast at all. There's just no sign of it. Uh, look, yeah, it looks like next week we'll have another heat wave. Now, often, of course, heat waves end in big thunderstorms. 
The last one didn't, really. There were a few storms around, but there wasn't very much. But often that is how they end, and that could bring a lot of rain. That can be a really mixed, is it good or is it bad, in a set, in this sort of situation. Because actually what we need for the ground and for rivers and the plants and so on isn't a thunderstorm. What we need is two days of constant drizzle. Because you could have the same amount of rain fall in an hour as two days of drizzle. And the thunderstorm falling in an hour, a lot of it will run off and end up in the drains and not where we want it, which is soaking into the ground, whereas the drizzle will just soak in nicely. And are we expecting more droughts like this in the coming years as a result of climate change? It's worth saying that under climate change, we expect drought periods to become more likely, which is an odd statement because we also expect intense rain to become more likely and more intense. And they're really have a funny sort of how can you have more rain and more drought? And the answer is, basically, you don't change the average a great deal, the average amount of rain, but you change how it comes. Particularly in the summer, you expect it to be probably drier most of the time. So more runs of long, dry periods. But then when you do get rain, which tends to be in summer convective, it's heavy showers and thunderstorms and so on. Because the atmosphere is just warmer, it holds more water. And so when you get the shower, there's more water in the storm, there's more water in the shower clouds, there's more rain to fall out, so the rain is just heavier. So it leads us to a problem where we expect more flooding and more drought. They're an odd combination. And of course, what we might find is droughts that end with flooding. Those flash floods can be quite dangerous because they're sudden inundations. They're hard to predict And you often see it's difficult for the forecasting and the warning systems because we'll give yellow warning across huge swathes of Britain for thunderstorms with danger to flooding and so on. The problem is for any individual, your odds of being hit by a problem are really low. And so they can't go out giving in red warnings because you'd have to warn a red warning for the whole of England and one village gets hit. You can't do that. It's a ridiculous way to behave because nobody would pay attention. You'd very quickly have the crying wolf problem. So I think that's a difficulty on how we can handle in future under a climate change scenario, how we do warnings and so on for flooding. I think it's something that really needs looking at. Let's take a break now. In part two, we hear from John Grant, a climate resilience expert from Sheffield Hallam University. To me, it seems close to crazy that we spend all the effort of collecting, processing, purifying, pumping, and then somewhere between a quarter and a third of it, you just flush down the bog. John Grant, climate lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University, joins me now. So, John, we find ourselves in a sticky or rather dry situation in the UK regarding these droughts. What do you put them down to? Well, quite simply, it's climate change. You know, yes, this could have happened as a random event, but we are looking at at least 10 times the chance of something like this happening because of the fact that, that, you know, it's more than 1.2 degrees warmer than the average or the temperature back at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And this is the party. And this is not a new normal This is probably the wettest it's going to be that we're going to see until, you know, 8,000 years. This is it. This is changing and it's still changing. So I can't tell you how bad it's going to be. And the hosepipe ban is something that is going to frustrate people. But I think they'll also appreciate that it is necessary. What are the ways we can protect and even boost our water supplies in the meantime? Well, of course, stopping leaks is the the one that's being put out there. That, you know, a tiny... Humans in their homes proportionally use quite a small amount. Agriculture is the biggest user, followed by, I believe, leaks, followed by then people. So, you know, we might look at, at low water consumption agriculture. That would be very interesting. There are some methods that are being used in places like Australia and the like that have a, an enormous reduction in, in how much water they use. Perhaps not that suitable or our agricultural industry don't, doesn't like to change. And, you know, they've, they've known enough rainfall to, to do that. This idea of stored water 
on site is not something that agriculture does but coming back to our homes the easiest one and i'm looking at it through my window at the moment is is i have an enormous water butt 1500 liters and that pumps water from flushing my toilets so through the winter all of it spring and autumn definitely but it stopped now but it, it, it for the most part the flushes on my toilet are all rainwater so i have a separate system I have a separate system so you can't contaminate fresh water because it turns out that rainwater flushing away human waste is not a problem. To me, it seems close to crazy that we spend all the effort of collecting, processing, purifying, pumping, and then somewhere between a quarter and a third of it, you just flush down the bog. And so I would like to see houses designed with that in mind where you had some kind of rainwater collection, minor filtration, and then the use of that water for non-drinkable uses. So that's watering your garden, flushing your toilet, maybe even washing your clothes. Turns out that you don't need to wash your clothes with water that you can drink. And the Rivers Trust is calling for a change in how we value water. Do you think that things like your suggestion of making the most of rainwater will eventually become necessary going forward? I think it will be absolutely critical. We are moving forward and the idea of resources being valued is something that is a, a much wider topic. And here we are with water and that is, you know, precious beyond measure. And so, yeah, hopefully people will start to treat water with the respect that it deserves. And I suppose people in the UK don't because it tends to rain every other day. But that still doesn't take away how precious it is. And yeah, climate change is, it's weird, isn't it? Because warmer world means that there's, for every one degree of temperature rise in our atmosphere, you put no less than 5% more water in the air so actually it means that there's more water to fall on us so the pump that pumps water from the oceans to the land has more water in it because we've got warmer air so in theory and there are some very dodgy individuals who don't really understand the mechanics of this go we're not going to have a shortage of water then john that isn't how it works because as well as the atmosphere carrying more water, where it dumps that water in rain, snow, will change too. And it is that change, even in a little island like the UK, that we're already seeing. The southeast of the UK, incredibly, is about as water stressed as North Africa. And that just blows my mind. And it's not because, well it is because it gets a lot less rain than the rest of the UK. And I'm sure people listening to this, you know, London is significantly drier and certainly that area within the M25. It is a microclimate, not that micro, it's quite a big area actually, but it is an area that, that is so warm that it just doesn't want, the air doesn't want to give up that moisture and it tends to blow over it and land somewhere else frustratingly. So yeah, we are in a, a new world and what that world is going to look like, it's definitely going to be drier in the southeast. More than that, I'm a little uncomfortable sort of projecting to be fair. There's more on this story online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. Thanks for listening. We're back on Monday at 4pm.